So, so far in this, in this course, we learned how to analyze the requirements for a given software project or a uh, systems um, project for a system design. Um, we did that with interviews and things like that, collecting artifacts. And then we took that information and we tried to develop use cases, which is what we talked about in the previous unit, this idea of creating these, uh, these use cases, which kind of tell us what the system should be capable of doing. In this unit, we go one step further where we discuss the things that make up our system. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to talk about the things in the problem domain. So first, what is a problem domain? Uh, it's a fancy way of saying it's the area of the user's business need that is within the scope of the new system. So we're just talking about what we're developing this new system for. That is the problem domain. So it's just a fancy way of saying, you know, what, what's the problem that we're actually studying? The things are those things that users work with when accomplishing tasks that need to be remembered by our system. So anything our system has to track are the things that we want to model or the things that we're going to talk about in this unit. Examples of things might be products, sales, shippers, customers, invoices, payments, things like that. So all that stuff that we have to keep track of. Um, we model these things uh, using domain classes uh, or data entities. Mostly, uh, you'll talk about data entities in, in database classes. In this class, we call them domain classes. But um, again, in the database world, you would call them data entities. So uh, to identify things, there are two techniques that we talk about in this course. We have the brainstorming technique, which is where we uh, use a checklist of all the usual types of things and we brainstorm anything that might fit in that, uh, in that category or in that class of, of things, so in that category. Um, the other technique we use is the noun technique. This is where we take everything that we found in our, in our requirements gathering phase. Uh, we take all the stuff that we figure out and we, um, we try to list all the nouns that we found in that analysis. And, uh, and we come up with a huge list of things and we try to pare that down. Um, so that's basically what the noun technique is. So the brainstorming technique is, um, is pretty, pretty straightforward. So you, you ask yourself, are there any things? And um, basically, you're, you're breaking this into categories. So for example, are there any tangible things? Are there any roles that are played? Um, are there any organizational units, uh, devices, sites, or locations, and events? These are all different types of things. You can make up other categories depending on what type of system and what business you're in. So in different businesses, you might have some other categories that you could look at. But once you create these categories of things, uh, then you try to think of what things would fit into each one. So for example, for tangible things, what tangible things are there uh, in this problem domain that I'm studying? Uh, so for example, an airplane, a book, a vehicle, a document, a form. What types of roles are played? So what, ty what kinds of people... Uh, exist within the problem domain. Uh, employees, customers, doctors, patients, users, system administrators. What organizational units are involved? Uh, the division, what departments, sections, task force, work groups. What types of devices might be involved? Sensors, timers, controllers, machines, sorters, printers, containers, all that stuff. What locations might be involved? And finally, what types of events, which are, are things. So a flight is an event, and it's something that we have to track, right? So it's something, you know, when we think about taking a flight somewhere, we track it. That's something that has to be remembered by the system. A call, a log on, log off, contract, purchase, order, payment. All that stuff has to be tracked. So we create this huge list of stuff that we're going to, um, uh, that we're going to think about as possible things that we have to track in the system. And again, these are all things that are within the problem domain, within the system that we're studying. And we found that stuff, you know, we were thinking about this from the analysis phase. In most cases, the brainstorming technique is going to involve the stakeholders. Let's talk about the specific steps for brainstorming. So step number one is you identify a user and a set of use cases for that user, which we've already done in the previous unit. Then you're going to brainstorm with that user to identify things involved when they're carrying out that use case. Um, so things about, with, about the information that should be captured by the system. So once you get this list of things that, um, that the user knows they're going to be tracking or needs captured by the system, then we're going to go forward and, and try to think of uh, types of things or categories um, that are potential things that they're going to track. So we're going to try to get them to think about what they might need. Uh, in the future. So some questions that we can ask to sort of drill into that. Number one, are there any tangible things you store information about? Uh, 
Are there any locations involved? Are there any roles played by people that they need that the system needs to remember? And fourth, we're going to continue to work with all the types of users and stakeholders to expand the brainstorming list. So we've done this for one use case or for one set of use cases for a certain type of user. Then we'll move to the next type of user and brainstorm with that person or you know a stakeholder within that group to uh, identify additional nouns or things that we can track with the system. And when we're done, we're going to merge the results, eliminate any duplicates, and compile an initial list. So we're basically going to create that final list by merging everything that we learned, eliminating duplicates that multiple stakeholders identified, and then we'll have our initial list of things that we think we need to track with our new system. So the noun technique is a little bit different. Uh, when the brainstorming technique, what sets it apart, is the fact that you have to have a stakeholder to help you do uh, the brainstorming. With the noun technique, we make the assumption that we don't have a stakeholder or users to help us brainstorm. So we have to use the analysis that we've done to try to identify these nouns. So it's a technique to identify problem domain classes or things by classifying, finding, classifying, and refining a list of nouns that came up in discussions or documents. So again, a little bit different. It's a popular technique for systems analysts. It's uh, um, very systematic. But one issue is that you do end up with long lists and many nouns that are not things that you need to be stored by the system. So you're going to get a huge list and you have to pare that down. So you do get a lot more information than perhaps you need when you use this method. Uh, one of the other things, um, it's difficult. Um, you might have some difficulty identifying synonyms and things that are really attributes. We'll talk more about what attributes are later uh, and how that affects our, our identifying of things in our system. But it's a good place to start if you don't have users that are able to help you do brainstorming. So if you don't have users around that can help you do brainstorming, it's too complicated to do that or, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, for a large system, sometimes it's, you can't always count on users to do that. So this is a much more, um, a much more in-depth way of, of, of identifying these things uh, without having to involve the users. You know, and then, you know, the, the thing about the users as well is they don't always know everything, right? The users don't always know all the things that they keep track of, they take things for granted. So you can certainly miss things when you work with the users and you might get lulled into a sense, uh, you know, a false sense of security that um, uh, that you've identified everything only to find out that you haven't. But we'll talk more about that later on and how we mitigate those those concerns. So in our uh, textbook, the RMO use or the RMO um, case study that they talk about, this is an example of nouns that somebody came up with when they... Um, when they did their uh, their when they used the noun technique to identify things in the system, so basically this this uh, person that generated this list probably used the use cases to identify in the descriptions to identify all the stuff that they think they might have to track, all the nouns that were involved. So this is all the things that are nouns that they identified in those use cases. Now you notice here on the right hand side, uh, they made some notes. In some cases, they say we know what this is. We don't need to worry about it. Um, other things, it says, I'm not sure what this is, not sure if we have to track it, we have to go back and research that. So maybe you do have to go back and get some additional information to find out if that is something that you need to, uh, to keep track of. And of course, once you complete this list, this is something that you could easily give to a stakeholder to say, can you verify or can you fill in some blanks for us or can you explain further some of these details? So let's talk about the official steps. Uh, first, using the use cases, actors, all the information about the system that we've gathered, including inputs and outputs, we're going to identify all the nouns that are associated with the system. Um, for the RMO case, uh, that would be things like bank, change request, summary report, transcription report, uh, accounting, back order, um, all the stuff that you just saw in the previous slide from that RMO case in the textbook. The second step is using other information from existing systems, um, current procedures, reports, and forms, uh, we're going to add items or categories of information needed, so we're going to build that list a little bit. Um, next, uh, we're going to, so the third step, as this list of nouns built, we're going to refine it, um, and we're going to ask some questions to see if we should refine that list. So those questions first, is it a unique thing the system needs to know about? If the answer is no, we're going to eliminate it from the list. Is it inside the scope of the system that you're working on? So if it has nothing to do with the system, you're going to eliminate it from the list because we don't need to keep track of it if it's not something that's within our system. Does the system need to remember more than one of these items? Um, and um, then you're going to ask some additional questions um, to see if you should exclude it. Is it really a synonym for some other thing that you've identified? 
Is it really just an output of the system produced from other information that you've identified? Uh, or is it really just an input uh, that results in reordering uh, some other information? Um, I'm sorry, recording some other information. So uh, if any of these things are true, you're going to exclude that uh, noun from the list. So these are just ways and techniques that you can use to try to pare down what you actually need. Another thing is we can ask the questions to research. Um, is it likely to be a specific piece of information about something uh, that you've identified? So if it's a specific piece of information about something you've identified, then that's an attribute. So for example, you might have a noun of um, person's name. Well, a person's name is not necessarily, while that is a noun, that's not necessarily something that we have to keep track of as an entity in our system. It is rather an attribute about an instance of an entity. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but this is where we're trying to identify attributes. Is it something that you might need if assumptions change? So if things change down the line, is this something you might need later on? Um, you know, it's always good for forward compatibility to try to include things like that. Uh, and fourth, um, so we're going to create a master list, kind of similar to what we did in brainstorming. We're going to create a master list from all this work that we've done. And uh, we're going to note which ones should be included, which are excluded, and which ones we need to research further. You just saw that in the previous slide uh, under those notes where I said, you know, some of these have to be researched. Some of them, we know what they are and they can be excluded for whatever reason, maybe a brief explanation so that somebody can verify that. Our last step is to review the list with the users um, and the stakeholders and other team members and define uh, the list of things for the problem domain. So hopefully come up with that final list of stuff that we have to keep track of in our system, including the attributes of that stuff, which we can do some further brainstorming to identify those attributes. Once we have all this stuff, so once we have identified all the things in our system, and again, we talked about two techniques to do that, brainstorming and noun technique. So once we've identified all the things in our system, now we can start worrying about how we're going to model the uh, um, the domain or the uh, um, these uh, these entities or these things and how they relate to one another. So there's two techniques we're going to talk about that can do that. The first one is uh, entity relationship diagrams. Now the entity relationship diagrams are a legacy technique, but they're also used um, um, by database people. So in systems analysis and design, it's not common to use entity relationship diagrams anymore, but they are common and they are very useful in the database world. So I'll talk about what they are and what they look like so you're familiar with them. If you've taken any database classes, you may have seen these diagrams before. Um, but um, you're also going to talk about the object-oriented technique, which is class diagrams. So we'll talk about that next after entity relationship diagrams. So an entity relationship diagram shows basically the same information as the class diagram, which I'm going to talk about later, um, but I just want to kind of lay the groundwork here and show you what an ER diagram looks like. So the thing about ER diagrams, as I mentioned, it's not UML. So this textbook in this class, we uh, discuss mostly UML techniques for systems analysis, and ER diagrams are clearly not a UML technique, but like I said, it's widely used by data analysts in the database management world. So that's why we have to be familiar with it. It's also a good deliverable to give somebody in the database world. So there really is no standard notation, uh, but most developers, most database people tend to use the crow's feet notation, which I'm going to show you here in, uh, in just a few minutes. Um, ERD is not good for showing generalization and specialization relationships or whole part relationships. You'll learn more about that in the class diagram. So when we show class diagrams, I'll talk about what generalization uh, and whole part relationships are aggregation. So we'll talk about aggregation and generalization. And that's something you really can't show in an ER diagram. Um, and mostly because it doesn't matter for database people. Uh, a database administrator, and you'll see what this is later on when I show you, but they don't care about aggregation and they don't care about generalization and specialization. Uh, they only care about the relationship of these things to each other. So you'll see what I mean by that later on. So before we can really uh, dive into an ER diagram, I just want to give you a little bit of background. And, and for those of you that watched the supplemental presentation on structured analysis um, and design, uh, I'm going to kind of review some of that information here so you can fast forward here if you've already viewed that. Uh, but we start with, in, in a structured technique, we always start with a, um, with a uh, context level data flow diagram. And that's equivalent to the use case. So we've been discussing use cases in the previous unit. A uh, context-level data flow diagram is sort of equivalent to that. A little bit different, though. As an example, uh, in a uh, context-level data flow, you draw a circle or an oval that represents your entire system. Um, so you just draw something that says, 
here's my entire system. And then you put on that drawing um, what we call sources and sinks. So those boxes that you see are the sources and the sinks. In this case, we have a customer uh, and a sales rep. So a source or a sink is someone who either provides or gets stuff from our system. So they're a use. So they're kind of like our actors, right? So a um, so if you were converting a context level diagram to a use case diagram, those boxes would become the actors. And likewise, these arrows that I'm drawing on here, these would be your actual use cases. So these are things that you're describing what they're getting, either what they're providing or what they're getting from the system with those arrows. So each one of those arrows would most likely become a use case in a uh, use case diagram. So again, it's a little bit different, but it shows the same information, it's just a slightly different, uh, uh, different technique or a different um, syntax to do so. So once we have a context level diagram, you can decompose that further into, uh, into a level one, level two, and level three diagram. So as an example, this is a level one data flow diagram. I still have my sources and my sinks. Um, I add some processes, so I decompose my system. In this case, I decomposed it into two separate processes, processing order and processing payments. Uh, and the sources, uh, I'm sorry, and there's also uh, data stores. So um, the data stores are types of information that we're going to store in our system. So then I would start drawing lines that show uh, basically those use cases, more or less. So what, what a sales rep puts into the system, and once they do that, what happens with all that stuff? You know, what, How does it move around the system? What types of data stores is it using? And of course, you would have labels on all this stuff. I don't have labels on here because I'm just showing you an example, but there would be um, labels on all those arrows, and you may even have a narrative to describe what's happening. So this would be a lower level uh, data flow diagram. So once we have all that, that allows you to draw an entity relationship diagram. So that's why I kind of showed you that stuff first so that you would be familiar with what, you know, how we're deriving this entity relationship diagram. Uh, if I were teaching a traditional uh, systems analysis and design class using the structured technique, we would have spent the first couple of weeks learning about data flow diagramming before we even talked about entity relationship diagramming. Um, but once we have the, uh, the uh, data flow diagram, then we start to create our entity relationship diagram, which shows how the stuff that we're keeping track of or everything that's in those data stores that you saw, um, we're going to try to think of all the things or we'll know basically after we do a data flow diagram, we know exactly what's going to be in those data stores, what, what the processes are using from those data stores. And we try to plot all those onto our entity relationship diagram and show the relationships between all of that stuff. So, so far you can see here that a customer has a relationship to an invoice and an invoice has a relationship to an item. Uh, and you can kind of see that a customer doesn't have a direct relationship to an item in the system. Their only relationship to an item is through an invoice and their only relationship to sales is through an invoice. Um, so you get some sense of the, um, of the relationships there. But we have to use some notation to indicate the cardinality of those relationships. So in data flow diagramming, we talk about cardinality. In class diagrams, we call it multiplicity. We'll talk about that later. But in ER diagrams, you'll hear the term cardinality. It's a database term. So what is cardinality? That's the degree to which things are related, more or less. So we have symbols that can show that. Now, these symbols will make a lot more sense in the next slide, but I'll just show you what they look like here. Uh, so the symbol that you see on the screen right now, it's rather small on the left side. Um, it looks like a sort of a circle with a line going through it is a, is zero. So we're saying uh, zero um, items or, or the relationship is zero, meaning you can't have any of those items in the relationship. Well, th this will make sense in, in just a minute. The solid line is a one and the multi-line or the, uh, what, this is where the term crow's foot notation comes from. It means many. So those three lines indicate many. So you have zero, one, and many. And then we can combine those symbols to create our relationships. So if we wanted to show a zero to one relationship, it would look like this. If we wanted to show a um, zero to many relationship, it would look like this. If we wanted to show um, a one to one relationship, it would look like this. And finally, a um, one to many relationship would look like this. So starting from the top, you've got your zero to one, zero to many, uh, one to one, one to many. And we'll talk about these again when we talk about multiplicity in the class diagramming technique for, uh, for UML. So how do I put those on this diagram? Well, the way you do this is uh, you say to yourself, what is the cardinality of a customer to invoice? In other words, a customer can have 
how many invoices? Can they have zero invoices? Sure. Could they have one invoice? Yes. Could they have more than one? Of course. So I would plot that. Uh, it would look something like this. So our customer, and you read it down. I, so basically the way you read this is the customer can have zero or many invoices. And an invoice can have one and only one customer. Likewise, an invoice can have exactly one sales person. And a salesperson can have zero or many invoices, hopefully more than zero, or else they won't be a salesperson for very long. Um, so our salesperson can, can have zero or many invoices. Our invoice, I'm sorry, our items, so our items can appear on zero or many invoices, hopefully more than one, you know, because otherwise they won't be items for very long. Um, and our invoices can have zero, or I'm sorry, one or many items. So the invoice can have one or many items. Now, one thing I want you to notice here is you've got a many-to-many -many relationship between items and invoices. Whenever you see that in an ER diagram, you have, uh, that, that's usually an indication you're missing something. There's some entity that you have to add to this diagram. In the database world, this is usually part of our normalization process. Uh, but in ER diagramming, we just we look at this and we say, okay, I've got a many-to-many -many relationship. I need something that ties together that relationship. In this case, I could add an additional um, entity, in this case, a line item from the invoice. And the way I fix this diagram, it's very simple. You take the two relationships that are currently on item and invoice. So you take that relationship and you crisscross them across the item that you've added. And it will fix it for you sort of automatically. So it looks something like this. I pull um, uh, the first relationship across the line item, then I pull the other one across and then I put in a one-to-one -one relationship on each side. So this makes a lot more sense. Now I have an invoice that can have one or many lines, one or many line items, and line items will always be on exactly one invoice. They can never be across different invoices. Our items can be on zero or many line items, and our line items always have just one item type. Now they could have a quantity of two, a quantity of 50 or whatever, um, but there's only one type of item on each line item. And that gives us that many-to-many -many relationship. So that's the way we would fix this. Uh, there may be other entities that we have to keep track of in the system. This is a very simple diagram. So in a real ER diagram, you would have lots of additional entities. So in this case, we might, uh, you know, a customer would have a relationship to address and phone number and email. The item would have a relationship to category and supplier. Um, you know, and if we were doing... Um, ER diagramming is the primary technique in this course, I would probably ask you to fill in the rest of these uh, relationships here as a homework assignment. Um, but again, we don't really do this in this class, but it's good to know this. And, and you are expected to know this to some extent for uh, systems analysis and design for the object-oriented techniques. Once you finish all this stuff, if you're a DBA or if you're a database person, you would take that ER diagram and you would use it to basically create your database uh, design. So this might be what your database design looks like. Obviously, you're going to um, show the connection of the firing keys to the primary keys. You'll learn about this stuff if you haven't already in a database class. Um, and then at some point, you might even normalize this further. You might say, well, the address and the phone number should be on a different table. The supplier might be required on a different table. So you would start that normalization process, which we're going to talk about that a little bit in this class after the midterm. But for right now, um, just know that the ER diagram would be used for a database design. All right, so now we know how an ER diagram looks like. Let's talk about um, the uh, domain classes or do the class diagram um, and how we use that to diagram or model. So I'll use the term model a lot, by the way. When we say modeling, we're talking about a diagram, basically. It's a fancy way of saying diagram. Um, but we'll talk about how we can model these things in a class diagram. So first, um, a couple things we, we have to define. Attributes. Uh, so an attribute describes one piece of information about each instance of the class. Let me just take a second to explain what a class is. I don't have a slide that explains this, but I guess there's some assumption that, that a lot of you probably know this already. But um, but what is a class? When I explain classes, I like to use the example of biology. If you take a biology class, um, you know one of the things you learn about is the classification of animals in the animal kingdom. And you have you know these classifications. You have plants. You've got animals. You've got um, you know you've got uh, all different types of animals. So there's a 
a classification of animals for reptiles, human or uh, you know reptile, uh, mammal, and so forth, birds, and so forth, and so on. Uh, and then beneath those, you have additional types. So there's specific types of reptiles, specific types of um, of mammals, and specific types of birds. And then beneath those, you have even more specific. So every organism that's studied in biology has sort of this full name that tells you how it's classified. Um, so if you think about it, you know, when you look at a, uh, at a dog, that is a class of that, that, that a dog is a classification of a certain type of mammal and mammal is a classification of a certain type of animal. Uh, and there might be a specific classification of dogs called the collies and there could be a, a, a specific instance. So you can create an instance of that collie, which is a type of dog. So if you create an instance of it, that would be Lassie, right? So Lassie is an instance of dog. And dog can have uh, can be a subordinate of the classification uh, mammal, which could be subordinate of the uh, of animal, as an example. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about classes. So a lot of people get lost in the term classes, but when we talk about classes, we're, what we really mean is classification, right? So it's a generic type of something, and then you can have uh, or a specific type of something, and you can have specific instances of that thing, and and. When we do a class diagram, when we talk about diagramming classes, we don't diagram specific instances of things. Uh, we're talking about a classification of something. So here's a type of thing, and here's some of the typical things that we have to know about that thing. So that would be attributes, right? So attributes describe that thing. So what is an attribute? An attribute is when we take a class or a classification of something. So when we take a certain class and we create an instance of it, that instance can be described by these attributes. So for example, a person can have a name. If I take a class of person and create an instance of it, the name can describe that specific person, among other things. So there's lots of things that can describe that specific instance of a class. So we do have to think about what attributes are uh, for a class. So a customer, for example, can have a first name, a last name, a phone number, etc. Of those attributes, something about that, you know, there has to be something that can identify a specific instance. So in a class diagram, uh, you're also going to think about not only the noun or the thing that we have to keep track of, but when we have a specific instance of that thing, what is it that identifies it? So you have to have some identifying attribute. Um, so one attribute can uniquely identify an instance of the class. So this is required for data entities and it's optional in our domain class diagrams. Uh, but as an example, a customer ID could identify a customer, uh, and that would just be a what we call a surrogate key or a made-up key that defines a customer. Uh, a natural key would be something like a social security number, because we all have a social security number, and if that's something you have to keep track of in your system, that should uniquely identify people, in theory. They don't always uniquely identify people, but in theory, they should. You can also have compound attributes, uh, which are a combination of things, but really, it's kind of a shorthand that we use. So for example, if you we're going to, uh, it, when you're describing a person, you say they could have a house number, a uh, street address, a city, a state, and a zip. But for shorthand, we could just say that's an address. So it's a compound attribute. Later on in a database, we might break that into its, uh, into its parts. But, uh, but for simplicity's sake, uh, we could just say that address is a compound attribute. All right, so attributes and values. So a class is a type of thing, which is as I was explaining. So a class is a type of, of thing and an object, so that's our, our, um, our other term that we have to worry about. So an object is a specific instance of a class. Uh, so as an example, if, um, if I talk about customers, all customers have attributes. For example, customer ID, first name, last name, phone number, work uh, number, etc. The uh, attributes, so each customer has a value for each attribute. So each of these attributes and each instance of a customer can have a different value. So that's what we're defining in a class diagram. When we talk about a class, we have to define all of the attributes about, the, uh, about that instance of something or about a specific object that could be created or that, uh, you know, that is a member of that class. So associations among things. What is an association? Association is a natural occurring relationship between classes, and that's a UML term. So in UML, we talk about associations. Now in the ER diagram, um, those boxes that I showed you, the technical term for those in ER diagramming is a relation. 
And then the lines between those things we call the relationship. So in an ER diagram, we only talk about relationships. In, um, um, in uh, UML or in class diagrams, we talk about associations, which is a specific type of relationship. So an association is a natural occurring relationship between classes. It's the most common type of relationship. But it's important not to confuse the term relationship and association in UML. So an association is a type of relationship. There are other types of relationships, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, so let's take a look at an example. If I have Mr. Smith and uh, in an accounting department, I could say the relationship between Mr. Smith and the accounting department is that Mr. Smith works in the accounting department. Or Mr. Smith um, has an order, or an order is placed by Mr. Smith. And that order could contain red shirts and jeans. So this is how I could start thinking about these relationships of things. So just to clarify, uh, an association on a class uh, um, uh, on a uh, class diagram in UML is multiplicity. So we use the term multiplicity um, to talk about cardinality. So in an ER diagram, we use the term cardinality. In the class diagram, we're going to talk about multiplicity. So it's the term for the number of associations between classes. Uh, so again, we're talking about UML in this course, so we're going to use the term multiplicity for the most part from here on out, as opposed to cardinality, which is uh, the term we use in the database world. So a relationship, in an, a, and I already talked about this, in an ER diagram in the database class, we use the term cardinality, which is the term uh, for the number of relationships in entity relationship diagrams, one-to-one, one-to-many, and so forth and so on. So again, multiplicity is what we use in class, but we call that cardinality in, a, in, a, uh, uh, in relationships in an ER diagram. But in a class diagram, the association is a type of relationship, uh, and they have multiplicity. Let's look at a, uh, so associations and relationships apply in two directions, and we read them each way. Um, so if, for example, a customer places an order, and an order is placed by a customer. You could say it both ways. Uh, we can show an example of that in just a minute, but let's talk about min and max multiplicity first. Associations can have minimum and maximum constraints. In other words, minimum is zero means the association is optional. Minimum is at least one. That means that the association must exist. Um, so, for example, you could say that a customer can't exist unless they have an order. If they don't have an order, they're not a customer yet. So that's an example of a at least one relationship. But you could also just as easily, depending on the business rules, you could say that a customer can be a customer even without an order. And that would mean that their association is optional, meaning that you could have a customer without an order. But you would define that in the class diagram. So you would have to make that clear. Um, so as an example, Mr. Jones has placed no order yet, but there might be many placed over time. That would be zero or more optional relationship. A particular order is placed by Mr. Smith, there can't be an order without stating the customer. Uh, that would mean multiplicity is one and only one mandatory relationship. An order contains at least one item, but could have many items. That multiplicity in that case would be one or more mandatory relationship. In words, it's kind of hard to follow that relationship. And this is why modeling is so important, because it makes these relationships so much more obvious. And it's a good way for us to think about those relationships and to uh, critically think about those relationships. So uh, there's also types of relationships that our book talks about. You have binary associations. Uh, I'm sorry, not types of relationships, types of associations. In ER diagramming, we would say types of relationships, but in, uh, in uh, class diagrams, we're going to say types of associations uh, because there are also other types of relationships. But the types of associations we can have are binary, which is where two things are, uh, have a relationship to each other. Now, uh, two things can have a relationship to each other, but they could have. Uh, but those other things could also have relationships to other things. So it doesn't mean that only two things can exist with a relationship. It just means that um, that two things happen to have a relationship with each other, but one of those things or both of those things could have additional relationships with other things. Um, so you can have one thing that has a relationship to twenty five other things, and it would still be binary um, as long as the one of those twenty five other things doesn't connect back to the initial, uh, uh, you know, the thing in the middle of that association. So that's a binary association. Um, so a course section includes students or members join a club. So that those would be binary associations. 
most of our associations in class diagrams, the vast majority of them on most diagrams are binary. So all those lines that connect things together, they're all binary associations. But you can also have unary associations or recursive associations, which is where something is related to itself. So examples of that would be a person that gets married to somebody. Uh, that is a unary relationship. So, um, you know, you have a person and when you create an instance of a person or when you have a specific person and another specific person, they can have a relationship to each other. So it's the same class has a relationship to itself. Uh, another example is a part uh, made using parts. Um, arguably, I would say that could also be an aggregate relationship, some kind of aggregation. But uh, for argument's sake, you could say that that's also a unary uh, association. Another example is ternary associations and nary associations. So a ternary is when you have a relationship between three things. Nary is a relationship between more than three things. So anything that's more than three. So you could have a you know five, six, seven, or whatever. I would say that those are very rare. Ternary associations are pretty rare. Urinary associations are not quite as rare, but not as common as binary associations. And I'd say that 90% of the associations on most class diagrams I look at are binary. So it's obviously the most common. One technique you can use to, um, to start thinking about these relationships between stuff is to use the semantic net technique. In our book, they talk about this, but it shows instances and how they are linked. So basically what you do is you take these classifications that you've created and you basically think about instances. So you take one class, you take a class and you create a couple different instances and you try to think of different scenarios for that instance and what they could or could not do with another instance of a class, of another class in order to figure out what that relationship is. Now, most of us do this intuitively. So for example, when I talk about invoice, customer, and, uh, and order, uh, you know, and items and things like that, I think all of us can intuitively understand those relationships because we've all had experience with that. Um, so you may think, well, this is silly. Why are we looking at this formal process to do this when most of us can think about that and figure out those relationships? But the thing about systems analysis and design is in many cases, you're designing complex systems that you don't have that deep understanding of. So it's good to have a grasp on some techniques that you can use to try to understand that. And that's a big part of being a systems analyst is being able to understand those, uh, you know, being able to figure out these relationships on things that aren't so obvious. Um, you know, and being able to understand these things in a, in a systematic way. Uh, so it's important to have some of these techniques in your tool belt as an analyst. So for example, if we have uh, John, Mary, and Sarah, uh, I could say that John can place an order, and that order can have two items. And then I could say, well, John could also place a second order, and that order could have three items, and so forth and so on. Mary maybe doesn't place an order, so that's another possibility. Or Sarah could place an order that has three items. So that helps me define what these relationships are going to look like. So let's take uh, what we've learned so far and start to create our actual model. Uh, up until now, we haven't really started diagram anything. We've just been talking about all the terms and the vernacular and all that. Um, so let's try to try to actually start putting this on a diagram. So uh, we're going to do a domain model class diagram. Uh, a class is a category of classification used to describe a collection of objects. We already talked about that. Uh, a domain class is classes that describe objects in the problem domain that we're studying. Uh, so that's why we call this a domain model class diagram. So a class diagram is a little different. So right now we're talking about domain model class diagrams, but you also have class diagrams um, in UML that show classes with attributes and associations and methods uh, if it models software. So a class diagram uh, in the software design uh, um, area, which we're going to talk about after the midterm, would not only include the class, but also the attributes and associations, which we're going to do. So the stuff you see there in yellow, we're going to do in this section. So we do do that in a domain model class diagram. But in a class diagram for design, a design class diagram, we would also have methods, uh, which we're going to talk about later on. Um, so again, what we're going to do is a domain model class diagram it's a special type of diagram uh, that only includes classes from the problem domain and not software classes, so we don't diagram any methods. So for those of you that have done a little UML in the past, you've had three sections in your class diagrams usually. The top was your, uh, was your class name, and then you would have your attributes, and then your methods. 
we're not going to diagram methods in the domain model class diagram, but we would use those in the uh, software design, which we're going to talk about later on. But for right now, uh, for when we're trying to understand that, remember, we're in the analysis phase here. We're not in the design phase, so we don't want to jump too far ahead. In the analysis phase, we're trying to understand the problem domain and understand what we're designing. So a domain model class diagram is going to help us do that. We're not going to talk about methods yet. So let's look at a uh, and an example of, of some of the syntax. Um, so a domain class has no methods. Um, so we already talked about that. The class name is always capitalized on our diagram and the attribute names are not capitalized and use a camelback notation. That's where the words run together and additional words after the first word are capitalized. A lot of uh, programmers do that when they create variable names. I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So here you've got the top part, which is the name of the class, you can notice that it is capitalized. By the way, I have a blue background on the top. That's not required and that's not common. I just do that in the presentation so that it's easy for you to see in the presentation what the class name is. Because uh, sometimes it's hard in these presentations to see that line there, so it just makes it more clear. Um, but in the real world and when you look in your book, you're not going to see um, uh, the shaded backgrounds or anything like that that I have in the presentation that makes it look pretty. Underneath the class, the name of the class, we've got our attributes. Uh, so all objects in the class have a value for each of those attributes. And notice that's our camelback notation. The first, uh, third, fourth, and fifth attribute you see there are correct. The first one is an incorrect way to show an attribute name where I have a capital N on name. That should be a lowercase n. So a simple domain model uh, class diagram. This is a simple example. Uh, so from that semantic net that we did previously where we had Sarah, John, and, and I forget her name, uh, and Mary that are uh, ordering, that have orders or ordering stuff in our system. So we had orders, we had items, and we had people. Uh, and we're going to try to do a simple class diagram to describe that. So a customer places zero or more orders. We learned that from the semantic net. An order is placed by exactly one customer. An order consists of one or more items. And an item is part of exactly one order. So that's our are uh, the relationships that we want, or the associations rather, that we want to diagram. So let's start with our customer. So we've got some attributes about our customer. We know that an order would probably have an order ID, an order date, and an amount. Uh, and we know that the order line item would have an item ID, a quantity, and a price, as an example. Um, there would be an association between these. Let's talk out these associations. So a customer places zero or many orders, and an order has exactly one customer. Okay, So the customer places zero or many orders and the order has exactly one customer. On the other side we've got an order which contains one or many line items and a line item always is on one order. So we always have an, uh, an order line item on one order and an order contains one or many line items. Okay, So we made a basic, uh, this is a basic example of a class, a domain model class diagram. And again, notice we don't have methods here for those of you that have seen this before. So UML notation for multiplicity. We talked about multiplicity already for the ER diagrams with those symbols, the crow's foot symbols. Um, but in uh, UML, we use a slightly different syntax. I think it's a little more clear in UML. Uh, we just use numbers. So as an example, uh, 0 dot dot 1, 0 or 1 optional, so 0 to 1. The 1, um, uh, 0 dot dot star is 0 or more, so 0 or many, you could say. Uh, 1 and only 1, then we have a many relationship, uh, and then we can have 1 and only 1, but mandatory, meaning that there, has, there can be 1, but there has to be 1. And then we've got 1 or many uh, mandatory. So these are some examples of uh, how you would use notation for multiplicity. And you'll see these throughout the rest of the domain model examples, the domain model class diagram examples that I have in this presentation. So let's take a look at a slightly more complex example. We have a customer with some attributes, uh, and we have an account and a branch. So we're doing a bank. So we're basically diagramming a basic, uh, the basic association between things uh, for a bank transaction. And then, of course, we have our transaction. So let's look at the, so we know that a customer would relate to an account. So a customer would have an account. Uh, accounts would probably um, uh, be associated with a branch. And any, uh, any a transaction would be associated with the account as well. So let's talk about the relationships. A customer can have one or many accounts. Uh, 
And an account can have exactly one customer. Our branch can have zero or many accounts, hopefully more than zero. Um, and our account can be, uh, has to be exactly one branch. Our transaction always occurs against a single account. And an account can have one or many transactions. So here's an example of a class diagram for a, uh, for a bank. I'll take this one step further. Uh, so I'll, put, I'll plot these uh, um, a slightly different uh, domain class model diagram. This would be maybe a course registration system. So we have a course, we have a course section, and then a student. Uh, so as an example, our course can have zero or many sections, and our sections are always for a single course. You wouldn't have a section uh, that contains multiple courses. Okay, I guess you could if it's like maybe physics with a physics lab or something like that, but we'll, let's, let's ignore that for just a minute. Uh, our course section can have zero or many students, and our students can have zero or many sections, right? So students can be taking lots of different classes, and our classes are going to have lots of different students. Now, if you recall, when we looked at the ER diagram, the entity relationship diagram, when it was a many-to-many -many relationship, we knew that there was a problem there, right? There was something hidden there, something that we're missing if there's a many-to-many -many relationship um, between two items in an ER diagram. Likewise, a many-to-many -many association in a class diagram usually tells us that we're missing some kind of class. Uh, there's something else that we have to use in this diagram to keep track of those things. So in a class diagram, you could show it like this, a little simpler. In a domain model class diagram, you can add an additional class, use the dotted line um, uh, to show a class that is used as a connector for, um, for two other classes when you have a many-to-many -many relationship. So that's an example for you how you would do the same thing we talked about in the ER diagram. So anytime you see a many-to-many -many relationship uh, on two, you know, uh, I'm sorry, a many-to-many -many association in a class diagram, you have to have a third class that uh, can tie those together. So in this case, we have course enrollment, which would indicate the students and what courses they're in, as well as the grade, by the way. So something else that we can do in class diagrams that we can't do in an ER diagram. Uh, so this is something, so generalization and specialization is something we can do in a class diagram that um, this concept does not exist in ER diagramming. So what is generalization and specialization? It's a hierarchical relationship where subordinate classes are special types of the superior class. Uh, and you'll also hear the term inheritance. So we talk about inheritance. I'll show you an example of this, but... Um, some terminology we have to be familiar with is first is a superclass. The superclass is the superior or more general class in a generalization specialization. And then you've got a subclass, which is the subordinate of uh, the subordinate or more specialized class in a generalization specialization. Uh, inheritance. So what is inheritance? The concept that a subclass inherits characteristics from a more general superclass. Uh, so let me try to explain this with an example. Um, Motor vehicle. So let's say you have motor vehicle as a class. All motor vehicles have certain attributes. I don't show it here because it, it, this diagram would get too complicated to show attributes. But if you think about it, all motor vehicles have a VIN number, as an example. And most of them have a color, right? So they all have a color. They all have a VIN number. But then we have subtypes of motor vehicles, right? So we have trucks, cars, and maybe tractor. These are all motor vehicles. All of them would have a VIN number. All of them would have a color. But trucks have some additional attributes, like their gross vehicle weight. Cars might have some additional attributes. Tractors would have different attributes, like uh, you know what type of tractor it is and things like that. Is it a farm tractor or a tractor trailer or what have you? And we could take this even further and say that a car can have other subtypes. So there, you could have sports car, sedan, SUV. And again, each one of these would have additional attributes. But if you have a sedan, a sedan is a specialization of a more generic car. And a car is a specialization of the more generic motor vehicle. So we have a generic class called motor vehicle. That's our generalization. And then we have specializations of truck, car, and tractor. The arrow that you see on the diagram, that, uh, that is how you indicate a uh, specialization and generalization example. So uh, you would always point the arrow to the more general class. And the other side is, uh, would, get, um, uh, would inherit attributes from the generalization. So the generalization would have some attributes. And when you have a... Uh, so any instance of an object that is a uh, specialization 
not only has the attributes of that specialization, but inherits everything from the uh, generalization as well. And when we talk about methods later on, those would also be inherited, but we'll talk about that later on. Let's look at a uh, and another uh, sort of a, another example based on what we've already learned about. You know, we, we, we already did this basic class diagram for a bank account, right? So we had transactions. Um, our transactions are for an account and our account is, uh, you know, is from a branch and has a customer. But an account could be an example of a generalization because we could have different types of accounts. For example, savings accounts and checking accounts. So checking account is a class that is a specialization of account, which is a, gener a, a more general or generic class. Uh, so it's a generalization. Um, but when you create an instance of an account that is a checking account, it not only has the attributes of a checking account, but it inherits the attributes for an account as well. So an account that's a checking account would have an ID, a date opened, a balance, a check type, and a minimum balance. Whereas a savings account would have an account ID, date open, balance, and an interest rate. Now, in theory, you could, um, you know, some students have a tendency to, instead of thinking about generalization and specialization, they have a tendency to draw, you know, both of these. They'll say, okay, we have a savings account and we have a checking account, and both of those have a relationship to customer and branch. But semantically, it's more accurate to say that you've got an account, which is the generalization that has a specialization of savings and checking, and you can see that it substantially simplifies the drawing. Otherwise, you'd have many additional relationships here that you'd have to worry about. Um, so, you know, in a database world, this doesn't really make sense. You know, in the database world, you really probably would have just an account table that would have all these attributes in a single table. So try not to get caught up in class diagrams of thinking about databases, especially if you've already taken a bunch of database classes. I think a lot of us have a tendency to do that. Instead, you want to think about this in um, uh, in more um, more generic terms, or I don't want to say generic, but um, but you're trying to understand these relationships in a different way. And this is a tool. You really have to think of this as a tool, not to design a database, but to understand how the system is going to work. Uh, so that's an important part of this. One other thing you have to realize about generalization and specialization is whenever you have a generalization, it's typically an abstract class. What does that mean, an abstract class? By the way, when you have an abstract class, you generally use italics for the class name. But what is an, an abstract class? It is a class that never has an instance uh, or never has an object based on that class. So you would never have just an account, You would, but you would have a checking account or a savings account. So those are concrete classes. They're concrete because you would have an object um, that, that would be of that classification. But you would never create an object uh, from account because it would be missing something. It has to be either a savings or a checking account. So typically with generalization and specialization, a generalization is an abstract class uh, that doesn't really exist in the system. Uh, it only exists as a specialization, which are our concrete classes. So another type of relationship in UML is the whole part relationships. Um, these are a little bit more complicated, but what is a whole part relationship? It's a relationship between classes where one class is part of or a component portion of another class. Um, so one concept here is aggregation. Aggregation is a whole part relationship where the component part exists separately and can be removed and replaced. Um, so in UML, that's going to be the diamond symbol, which you're going to see in the next slide. Uh, so a computer has disk storage devices. A car has wheels. Another example is composition. So composition is a whole part relationship where the parts can no longer be removed. And that's the filled-in diamond. So you got the open diamond uh, for aggregation and the filled-in diamond for composition. Uh, so example, a hand has fingers and a chip has circuits, for example. So what's the difference between these two? They seem very similar. But the, the, the primary difference is with an aggregation, you can replace the parts. Within a composition, you can't replace the parts. You can't remove those parts. So for example, if you have a car, you can replace the tires. You can replace the alternator. You can replace an engine. Most of these things can be replaced. Um, but with composition, you know, think about your hand. Your hand has fingers. You can't replace those fingers. Once a finger is lost, it's gone. Um, so so in, a, in a composition relationship, you can't remove the parts.
the uh, um, so when you're showing a composition relationship, you're saying here's a thing that's made up of these parts, but those parts have to exist. And once they have that part, that part cannot be replaced. Whereas in aggregation, you're saying here's something that's got some parts, but those parts can be replaced. They can be removed, and they can replace it with a different part. So just semantically a little bit different, those two. Let's take a look at an example. A uh, computer can have a monitor, storage, keyboard, main memory, and a processor. These are the parts of a computer. Um, so I would diagram it with that open arrow. So uh, the white arrow there is supposed to be an open arrow as opposed to a filled in arrow. Uh, but that open arrow would mean that my computer can contain all these different parts. Why is that not a composite relationship? Uh, you might tell me, hey, Brian, I can't have a computer without a microprocessor. So wouldn't that make this a uh, composite relationship? And I might argue that, well, I can replace that processor. So the fact that I can take that processor out, put a new processor in, means that it is an uh, aggregate uh, relationship or an aggregation. Um, but like, you know, similarly, though, a hand, I can't remove a finger and put another finger on, although some people are going to tell me, hey, Brian, guess what? You can do that. But um, you know, for argument's sake, uh, it, it, you couldn't really do that, or you can't take somebody's brain out and replace it with a different brain. Uh, that wouldn't work. So that you know, a brain is a part of the human body, uh, but you can't replace it. So that would definitely be a composite relationship. Um, so it's a little bit more clear in that case. Although somebody's going to tell me, hey, what about Frankenstein? But, uh, but for argument's sake, that's something you really couldn't do. So let's talk just a little bit more about relationships. So there are actually three types of relationships in class diagrams. We've talked about all three. Uh, we talked about association relationships, which are associations um, that are just like an ERD relationship, right? So an association is just like the relationships we discussed in the RDs. So these were our binary, unary uh, associations that had multiplicity, one or many, or a zero or many, and so forth and so on. We also have whole part relationships, which is where one class is a component or part of another class, as we just discussed. And finally, generalization and specialization, where you have abstract and concrete classes, where the concrete class is a, spe or a specialization of the more generic abstract or um, uh, abstract class. Uh, we talked about that concept of inheritance, where with the generalization and specialization, um, all the attributes, and if you're doing a class diagram for design methods, um, are inherited by the uh, um, by the superior superclass or the generalization in this case. So try not to confuse the term relationship with association. Remember that a association is a specific type of relationship, as are whole part and generalization specialization. So when we talk about a uh, um, the, the how different things relate to each other in a class diagram. If it's that line that we draw from one thing to another with multiplicity, we're talking about an association, which is how um, how these things naturally associate to each other. Whereas those special arrows I talked about, um, so the open arrowhead and then the closed and open diamond, those are our whole part relationships and our generalization and specialization. So you want to remember those terms and those symbols that are associated with each, with each of those. In our uh, case study example in the textbook. Uh, this is the example of a domain class diagram that they have from the book. Uh, and here's another example. Um, so that our book breaks them up into a couple different parts. I would encourage you to take a look at these. They're great examples that you can use to, uh, to do your case study um, homework assignments, which are uh, the, the bike messenger program, uh, or actually the shipping program from the bike messenger program. But, you know, that, that little case study that you do um, you can use this as sort of a guide to, to create those diagrams. So, and you can see some of the concepts that we talked about in these diagrams. So, for example, uh, an online cart is a generalization. There could be two different specific types of carts. There could be an active cart and a reserve cart. Um, so, in a reserve cart, you've got a hold four days attribute, but it also inherits that start date time, number of items, value of items, and status, and so forth. Uh, so that was the, um, um, the specialization generalization. Uh, I don't think they have too many that, in fact, we could take a look. Um, I don't believe there are any aggregate relationships in any of these. Yeah, so we have some, um, some specialization generalization relationships on the uh, RMO case study, but no, uh, no examples of, of aggregation. But 
Uh, I'd say those are a little bit more rare anyway in most diagrams. The other thing is I should mention about these diagrams is that um, there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of subjectivity in these diagrams. You know, if I asked all of you to create a class diagram, a domain class model diagram for the same description and the same use case, I think all of you would come up with a different diagram. And they would all probably be correct, right? I mean, you know, there might be some semantic errors or syntactical errors, but for the most part, they would probably be somewhat accurate. And, uh, you know, so there, there's, I guess what I'm getting at is there's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, just because one person diagrams it one way and somebody else diagrams it another way, it's not necessarily one is wrong and one is right. Um, it's They're both based on your understanding. So there is a lot of subjectivity in these, and it's sort of an art as much as it is a, uh, a science. Um, so when you do these diagrams, a lot of there's a lot of judgment call when you're creating these. You know, when do I create an aggregate relationship? When do I make it a specialization and a generalization? I'm going to post in uh, Blackboard. You should see a um, uh, just a brief paper that you can read that kind of discusses that concept of the subjectivity in these diagrams. And you know, one thing I've seen students do is try to way overthink these diagrams. You know, they'll agonize over whether something is an aggregate relationship or a binary. Uh, association and all that stuff. And, you know, it's important not to waste too much time agonizing on that stuff uh, and not get to caught up too much in those details. Um, but I just want you to know that, um, that that's certainly something that you have to be aware of. Uh, so like I said, in your book, uh, in the textbook, there are, for the RMO case, RMO case um, a bunch of class domain model diagrams that you can take a look at as an example. So some hands-on practice that you could do is given the complete RMO, CS, MS domain model, uh, the class diagram for sales, customer account, and subsystem examples that we just showed you. Um, so I just showed you the uh, order fulfillment subsystem domain class, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, I showed you the class diagram for sales and customer account. But you could use those to try to complete the order fulfillment subsystem diagram. And you could try completing one for the marketing subsystem and you could try completing one for the reporting some systems. So if you want to get a little practice, uh, you could do that. Um, and some of the classes and associations might be duplicated in more than one subsystem model. So you might see them on multiple diagrams. So if you wanted to get a little practice, you could certainly do that. Uh, but the other assignment, of course, um, the actual assignment is the, uh, um, the uh, case study, the running case study that we do throughout the semester, which you'll see on Blackboard. So you're going to do some class, uh, some domain class model diagrams in those as well. Um, but certainly you could practice with these if you wanted to. And I think that the book has uh, an answer key that you could look at for these. Uh, and if not, you can email me and I can send you um, some possible solutions that you could use for that. So that's it. So that's everything you need to know about uh, domain uh, class model diagrams for this course. In the next unit, we're going to expand on this, uh, and we're also going to learn some other diagramming techniques. We're going to talk about the activity diagrams, sequence diagrams, and state diagrams uh, for the analysis phase. Uh, and then that will be all we go over before we do the, um, uh, the midterm, which is going to cover all the analysis stuff that we've been talking about. One thing I want to mention here that I haven't really talked about too much before I, I end the, uh, the slide presentation here is that we've been concentrating up until now on the analysis phase. So one thing that we haven't done, and it's important to make this um, uh, distinction, one thing that we have not done is started to actually design a system. All of the activities that we've done until now and that we're going to continue to do in the next unit are all about trying to understand the system, understand what we need to do and make sure that we're designing a system that meets the needs of our users. So it's important not to jump too far ahead and start getting into the design phase. Um, but have a little bit of patience because after the midterm, we're going to dive right into the design phase and we're going to do um, more of the design activities. And those design activities are going to rely on what we've learned and what we've done in the analysis phase, which is what we're working on right now. So if you have any questions or any concerns, please let me know. Uh, thank you.